The instruction we receive this morning from God's Word and with the help of the creeds and the faith of our fathers is instruction in the doctrine of infant baptism. In the question that is asked in the Heidelberg Catechism, printed in your bulletins or available also in your Psalter, Psalters in the back, is this, question 74 of Lord's Day 27, are infants also to be baptized? And the answer that we give with the Reformed of all ages is yes, for since they as well as the adult are included in the covenant and church of God, and since redemption from sin by the blood of Christ and the Holy Ghost, the author of faith is promised to them, no less than to the adult, they must therefore by baptism as a sign of the covenant be also admitted into the Christian church and be distinguished from the children of unbelievers as was done in the Old Covenant or Testament by circumcision, instead of which baptism is instituted in the New Covenant. The truth, therefore, of infant baptism is in front of us and would be promulgated from this pulpit, if not only in this sermon, perhaps in a few sermons following. But I want to, in this sermon, beloved, <clears throat> to emphasize the basics, uh, the fundamentals of the doctrine of infant baptism. We want to do this positively. We want to do this stressing especially what the basis for infant baptism is. There's no question about the basis or the, the ground for baptizing believers, adult believers. They must have professed Christ if they have not before, and then they must be baptized upon this credible confession of faith. But the question is, why baptize the infants of believers? That's the question we want to consider. And the answer that's given in all of the Reformed creeds is simply this, the word and truth of covenant. You'll notice in the question we asked, that infants are to be baptized, and there's this, this ground, since they as well as the adult are included in the covenant and church of God. That's why they must be baptized. This is also the truth of the Reformed uh, form for baptism, which is a minor creed of the church to which all Reformed office bearers are obliged to listen to and to, and to heed and to teach. It's the truth. Why are we baptized? Because infants are in the covenant. It's also the truth of the Belgian Confession, Article 34. Why do we baptize children? Because they are to them as promised the kingdom as well as the covenant mercies of God. At every point, the Reformed faith is polemic, and because it is so important that we argue the truth of infant baptism in the face of its denial by many. And so it's all about covenant. But as well, there is something that needs to be said about covenant if we are to ground the truth of infant baptism in covenant. And that is, what is the fundamental truth of the covenant? And this, clear from the Bible, is the fact that God is a family God. The nature of his blessing, the covenantal blessing, is to bring us into his family, and this includes the physical seed or the spiritual seed from the physical seed of believers so that they too are members of the family. And this is what we will seek to uh, reveal or have revealed to us in the light of the word of God this day. But I want to ask the question also in this light of the truth of covenant, the basis for infant baptism, the truth of family, the blessing of God. The question is, who today will testify of these things. Who will testify in not only our church, but in all the churches of the land of the wonderful truth of the covenant of grace and the family God that he is as the basis for infant baptism? We need ourselves to be mighty in a witness here, and not just polemically, but living out of our life as part of the family of God. That is the first testimony to the world and to ourselves and even to other compromised Christians of the importance and great blessedness 
and joy and responsibilities of the people of God's covenant family, including the infants. And so we want to go to an outstanding bit of history in the book of the Old Covenant, before the Old Covenant, in fact, and that's the visit of God to Abraham. And we're going to go to Genesis 17, and we're going to read the first <clears throat> 16 verses of this, in which God visits Abraham when he's 99 years old. He appears to him, and he covenants with him. We're going to be working from that text in verse 7 that's so precious, where God promises to be the God of Abraham and his seed after him. We're going to see how this is the fabric, warp and woof, of the truth of the covenant, and it's just beginning here, and it's to be enfolded in the rest of the book of the Bible, Old and New Covenant. So Genesis 17 and verse 1, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram, or when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. And it will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abraham, or Abram, fell on his face and God talked with him saying, as for me, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, which means father of nations. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant. You are and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. and You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he was born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarah your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her, and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. And so we read the narrative the great covenanting of God with Abraham in his families. And Genesis 17, verse 7, is especially the verse we want to focus on. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. So, beloved, we have the covenant that is made with Abraham. There are other references to Abraham's being covenanted by God, and, for example, in Genesis 15, to which we'll be referring. Also, God was showing that he is the covenant God of Abraham when calling him out of Ur. That's recorded in Genesis 12. Other references... I believe no less than 13 are given 
to in the Bible of God covenanting with Abraham. So it's important that we understand what this all is about. And the, my first point here, and this fundamental point, is that this covenant is God uh, not only befriending Abraham, but making him a member of his family. So you have God saying, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations. This is what's called the covenant of grace, the everlasting covenant. And it's simply God visiting his people, his chosen people, chosen before the foundation of the world, and saving them blessing them with all the blessings that are in Christ Jesus by promise in the Old Testament and in the reality of the fullness of time when Jesus has come in the New Testament. This is nothing less or different than those blessings that are in Christ. There is one word that God has to say, and that's Christ. And all the blessings that are in him are in him and of the covenant are in Christ. And that's how we have to see this. This is not just something that's obliged upon us, but it's a great delight to know that God blesses even Abraham in Christ. So we have God here establishing his covenant between himself and Abraham and his children. That means a lot of things for Abraham. It means that, well, there will be family blessing, as we shall see, but also there will be a land that's given to him, all the land in which he was wandering as a stranger. He will be given the land of promise. There is as well a seed innumerable, as many as the stars in the heavens, children, and as the sand upon the seashore. How many stars do you think there are? How many grains of sand do you think there are? Is there more sand than stars? Is there more stars than sand? These things uh, boggle our minds. But God is speaking here of the blessing that he gives to Abraham. There will be protection for Abraham. There will be peace and there will be plenty for Abraham. There will be victories over the kings that take Lot hostage, and so on. In every way, God is blessing Abraham. And the fundamental idea of this blessing is God being a God to Abraham and to his descendants after him. No, I establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant, and here it is, to be God to you and to your descendants after you. Now that's amazing. Now God, we know, is the God of, of everyone. He's God. He's the only God. He's the God of inanimate, non-living objects. He's the God of creation and providence. He's the God of people, good and evil. He's over everyone as their God and their judge. But here, what God is focusing on is the blessing that he will be to Abraham and his children. And this is something that is what's called family. In other places, Abraham is called the friend of God. In other places, God is said to be the husband of his wife. The people that are covenanted with is his wife, and he's the husband of that people. The, judge, the, the Jehovah God is. Other places, he said to be the savior of them. But it all amounts to this, and this is brought out in the text. It amounts to family. And God coming close so that Abraham himself might be close to God in a family sort of way. Now, what's family? And in this day and age, we need to know that. In the brokenness of homes, the brokenness of marriages, and when there's a lot of independency, in the American spirit, not only, but among people who are very proud. There's no real understanding of relationship and, and service and love and giving that is pure and divine unless we understand just how God fellowships with his people as a family God. Now, this is not new. This is Abraham 
when he's visited by God and there's a covenant made with him, a promise and a bonding of God to Abraham, that's the essence of covenant, it's not new. Already in creation, theologians are for the most part agreed, and I think we should too, that Adam and Eve were made to be covenant family people. In Hosea chapter 6, I believe, in verse 7, it said that the people of Israel had transgressed the covenant like Adam or like people, like man, but the, the Hebrew word is Adam, like Adam. So there seems to be a reference there to what happened when Adam fell. He broke the covenant, and that means there was a covenant, and that means there was a family. And you think about it. In the garden before sin, Adam walked in the cool of the day with God and God with him. There was fellowship. There was peace with God. There was obedience to God. Don't eat of the forbidden fruit. Eat of the tree of life, picture of Jesus Christ himself, all the things that go for relationship and promise and, and fellowship with God, they're right there. Besides that, Adam, he was made, and it was not good that he was made alone. So God says it's not good that man should be alone. There must be a family of men. And so God made Eve. And to Adam and Eve was given the great charge, go into the world and multiply, have children. I will be your God, Adam and Eve, and the God of your children. This is what God is doing already in the garden. And this is one of the great terrible things of, of destroying Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and Genesis 3 with all of the scientific accounts that say that this is mythology or just mere literary way of putting things. Literally, historically, God has ever shown himself to be a family God of people on earth in their physical loins and from their physical loins he will establish something, he will make something. And it's called, as we read in this text here, a covenant. God being God in a family sort of way. That means he's father. We read in the psalmist, he's a, he's, he's a father to his children in the covenant. And he befriends them, and he loves them, and he protects them. And this is the whole beauty of God, loving anybody. You see, it's all grounded in God, as all doctrine is. The truth of God is that he's a family God himself. He's father and he's son. And they, they, the persons, commune with one another in the communion and love and breathing forth of the Spirit together. There's life, there's love. He didn't create because he was lonely. He created because he wanted to show the fullness of his own life and bring others into the family. Well, since Adam, and when he fell, and he fell, they have said no to family. It was the beginning of the rugged individualism of mankind. I will be God. I think rather that it is better that I call the shots. That's what Adam really said. When the devil said, yea, hath God said, and said that God was a liar, and said that God was not sincere in his death penalty. Adam became an individualist. But God, you see, he wouldn't be thwarted by that because he's the faithful father. And though people be unfaithful, he will ever be faithful to himself, as Paul says to Timothy. Beautiful. And so he came. He came. The father of Adam and Eve came. The family God of Adam and Eve came. And he retrieved them from the wreckage that they had made of themselves and the human race. And he brought them to repentance. And he promised them that he would put enmity between their seed and the devil's seed. Now see that there? Already God's saying, I have children I have children from you, Adam and Eve, and they will be distinguished from unbelievers, as the catechism says, baptism serves to do. It signifies that our children are distinguished from unbelievers. And so it was. Yes, indeed, the firstborn, Cain, would, or, or the, whoever killed the, Abel, Cain, would be a murderer. He would not be the seed 
of Adam and Eve, not the true seed, but then there'd be Seth. And then there'd be a line of the covenant. There would be this family people. And then Noah, God covenanted with Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And, and lo and behold, Noah and his family are saved. And none of them is deserving, but God is the one who's going to perpetuate this thing called the family salvation. And even though the whole world will be destroyed by a flood, they will be saved as by water together in the ark. The first household of faith, if we could say it that way. And then, of course, now to Abraham. And this is the truth of the entire Old Testament. In the Abrahamic covenant, in what's called the Mosaic Covenant or the Old Covenant that's done away with, that was superimposed upon this covenant with Abraham, it would include children. Always would include the children of the believers in their generations. And the sign of circumcision would be applied to the sons of Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob and to the 12 tribes and their families. It was all about this. Now, this is even the case in the new covenant, and that's what we have to understand. We have to understand that there is this continuation, this wonderful tapestry of gospel that's being woven in verses like this and in visitations of God to Abraham like this, so that there is this continuity of how God saves people. He saves them not just one by one, but yes, he saves individuals to be brought into the family, one family by one family. And then there's a whole church, the family of families. We are family. And it's not flesh and blood and ethnicity and personalities and likes and dislikes that unites us. It's the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. And so this is what's being taught here. And we've preached on these things before, and perhaps we'll visit these things in future sermons. When Pentecost comes, there's this amazing uh, pouring out of the Spirit, and the greatest miracle of Pentecost was the Sermon of Peter. And Peter says to the, the Jews who just killed Jesus Christ, the promise is unto you and to your children, even as many as are afar off. That's a rehearsal of the Abrahamic promise that shall not be annulled. And God, you see, is continuing his family way in what's called the new covenant, in the pouring out of the Spirit, the greater intimacy of God with his people. Now, you see, there's no longer, since the old covenant is done away, the Mosaic thing, and since the Abrahamic covenant not only survives, it, but is flourishing now that the Spirit is poured out, there's nothing between us and God our Father. In fact, there's a spirit poured out, the Holy Spirit of Jesus, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. And there's no trappings, there's no priest between us and God, except Jesus Christ, the mediator. And there's no blood of bulls and goats and promises only, but there's the blood of the new covenant, the new testament in Jesus' blood, as he says. And this is all continuing. In the New Testament age, we are the heirs of this family salvation of God. We and our children are. This also, this inclusion of the children in the, in the new covenant of grace, which is contested, of course, is without a doubt what Joel was prophesying in Joel chapter 2. And I'll read some of those words of Joel chapter 2, which ends in the prophecy of the new covenant, which is quoted in Acts 2. Acts, or Joel chapter 2, blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess, and day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains, and so on. But then, verse 15, Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and nursing babes. 
Let the bridegroom go out from her chamber, his chamber, and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach, that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? You see, Joel here is prophesying of the day of the Lord, which is judgment to all unbelievers which is judgment to nations and societies, to those who hold not Christ in great esteem and who regard not God as Father, who know him not as Father. But then there's the blowing of the trumpet in Zion because there's hope in Zion of God's covenant and that he will continue his covenant with them because of his own reputation. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Verse 18, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I send you grain and new wine and oil and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations, but I will remove from, from you, far from you. The northern army will drive him away into the barren and desolate land. What's happening here? is the beginning of Joel speaking of the new covenant blessings where there should have been wrath, new covenant blessings. That's why they had to assemble together, they and their children, to hear this word of hope and promise because God was going to do a new thing and the new thing would be this great further revelation of the one family thing that he's always had in mind. Bring the children. Bring the suckling children. Bring them all, sinners all. But I have a plan. I'm the great family planner, and this is going to be a new covenant, new relationship sort of thing because it'll be sealed in the blood of my son. And the Holy Spirit will sanctify the whole thing by breathing upon my people and filling them with the knowledge of everything that God has ever said. Jeremiah, to name just one other point, which shows that the old covenant doesn't do away with the people, nor does the new covenant, the children, in the midst of prophesying of the new covenant in Jeremiah 32, verse 38, they shall be my people and I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from doing them good but I will put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. God from Genesis and then Abraham and through the old covenant and into the new, that's us, is the family God. It's a wonder that Jesus, who came to do the will of the Father, told the disciples, now you don't hinder those children from being brought to me by those who believe that I'm the great high priest who needs to bless them. And so in all the synoptic gospels, it said, Jesus says, suffer the little children to come to me, forbid them not. And he takes those little children in his arms before they could say anything. And one of the synoptics has the word for infant. They can't say anything. They can't profess their faith. And he says, I bless you. Why does Jesus bless the children? Because he's the family savior the elder brother who would give his life for the children as well as for the adults. And so, without getting to all of the texts that could be brought out to prove that still there's this family salvation, the book of Acts records maybe uh, 10 or so baptisms, four of them, no less, are household baptisms. Household baptism, and whether there's believers or not there, makes no difference. The house is saved for the sake of the one who confesses faith. 
there is this movement of God into a house and into hearts in a house that will not be denied or resisted and must be testified to. God comes to unworthy individuals and unworthy homes. And that's why the Apostle Paul speaks to the believing woman whose husband not, might not be converted, don't leave. He may be saved one of these days. And you're not to leave because the children now are holy. And beloved, that holiness in 1 Corinthians seven fourteen is not just an outward holiness, and not just their being a setting aside. The apostle is referring to Levitical holiness, of which he'd be very, very familiar in the book of Leviticus, whereby the priest, through the washings and the ablutions, the preparing to worship God would, in this physical way, be pictures of cleanliness before God. Pictures of those who had the right of access, who had the Holy Spirit within them so that they could approach God on the behalf of the people. This is said of the children. Not halfway holy, not merely outwardly, covenantally holy, but the children are sanctified, set apart, by God, cleansed, and as our form says, forgiven all their sins. As we answer, as parents who present their children for baptism, we answer the question, do you acknowledge that though our children are conceived and born in sin, yet they are sanctified in Christ? And that's everywhere and always in the Bible, a reference to the fact that God saves the children of believers. Powerful stuff is exactly because this is the one word of God. And of course, to them then is to be given the sacrament of their being sanctified in Christ, members of God's family. The Old Testament, it was circumcision, Genesis 17, verse 7. The New Testament, it's baptism, which means the exactly same thing as circumcision. Colossians 2, 11 and 12. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Jesus or Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So the sacraments mean the exact same thing. There's differences. In the Old Covenant, circumcision was for the males, obviously, alone. They represented the whole of the family, the females of the family. It was a representative age. Priests represented the people. Moses represented the priests and so on. And, but now, the Holy Spirit has come out, or, or poured out, and in Christ Jesus, we read in Galatians, there's neither bond nor free, Jew nor Gentile, male nor female. And so all are baptized of the, the uh, children of believers as a sign of God's salvation of them, his being a father to them through Jesus Christ. Much more could be said, perhaps again at another sermon. But this is so vital for us. And there's two things more I want to say. First is that this covenant family salvation is a wonderful testimony to God's grace. That's what it is. The free favor of God to sinners. God came to Abraham. Came to Abraham. Abraham, before he was called, lived on the other side of the Euphrates River and Joshua says that the fathers on the other side of the Euphrates River worshipped idols. Now, we don't know exactly Abraham's situation there, but certainly God visited him in grace. It was because, not because of Abraham's merit. We read, in fact, that he was justified by faith, just as anyone is. But the fact that God came to him and then said, I'm also going to bless your children that come from your womb. 
is a testimony to the grace of God. And beloved, you think of that, the lesson of the children, the lesson of the helpless babes. We're learning it as grandparents. And some in the congregation with young children are, are learning this, how helpless they are. They just sit there on their back. And they can't do a thing except coo and ask for, for milk and uh, change a diaper, all this very earthly stuff. A beloved, the psalmist says, and Jesus quotes from the psalmist, out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, God has perfected praise. Why? Because they're testimonies to the fact that salvation is not of him who wills or who runs or who even crawls or rolls over. It's of God who shows mercy. That's what God would show on the earth. And you say, well, well, in the spiritual family, he shows that. But God is not satisfied just with a spiritual, ethereal representation of his grace. He shows grace on the ground. He shows grace among the flesh and blood of his people. He does this, you see, to show just what the incarnation was all about. God came to the ground. He could have came and saved us from heaven. He could have become our family God, just according to his election and just taking us all up, beaming us up, whatever else. But he came down. And now he comes down to the homes of unworthy sinners and saves, even through feeble parental efforts and feeble shoutings from pulpits, just whom he will, from our own flesh and blood. What a wonderful God. The promise is not that he will save everyone. Never was the promise. Even among those circumcised, there was an Ishmael, not part of the covenant. But God said, I want it to be known that I am establishing a beachhead in time, a family among the ones who've been cast out, among the seed of the devil, I'm God, and the greatest thing I'm going to do is show my fatherhood in being the father of Jesus Christ and also, by Holy Spirit, the father of him in human nature. And pouring out my spirit upon flesh and in homes to make my people a home for me. Now, this is beautiful. We can go into all of the other ways that the covenant of grace is all of God. You look at Genesis 17 and verse 7. It's all about God. It's not about Abraham, that's for sure. Abraham will laugh, so will Sarah. But God says at every point here, I'm almighty God. Walk me for me and be blameless, he says. And I will make my covenant between me and you. I will make my covenant. And I will multiply you exceedingly. As for me, verse 4, behold, my covenant is with you. Not our covenant, mine. And you shall be a father of many nations. Changes his name, changes his identity. And then verse 6, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. And on and on he goes. This is called the truth of the fact that the covenant is unilateral. There's a one-sidedness in this. Among people, there might be friendships and covenants and pacts and treaties, and rulers make these things between themselves, and there's mutual conditions that people must perform, but the essence of the covenant of grace of the family is God alone. 
This is brought out, of course, in Genesis 15. If you look back at that, and maybe you can talk about this as your families meet together over the bread of life in your table fellowship. God appears to Abraham in a vision, says, do not be afraid. And then in this vision, and Abraham's in a trance, God says to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, Genesis 15, 9, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him and cut them in two and down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And then when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away in sowing. And then this deep sleep falls on Abraham. And then, lo, it came to pass, verse 17, the sun went down, it's dark. Behold, there came, appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between the pieces. The animals were cut. They were butchered. And there's this appearance of God himself, a smoking oven, a burning torch passing between the pieces. And on the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your descendants, I give this land, and so on. This is the way that God says, I am the one who makes this thing, this relationship. I'm the sole father of my children. I don't need a mother I don't need the children to cause themselves to be born again. I'm the father. And this means it's all about Christ. That's what it means. The father of the son. And you see what God's doing here in this cutting of the covenant, as they call it, cutting the pieces apart is swearing by himself, if I'm not faithful, I will be a God who executes himself. Now, that's impossible to think about, but that's basically what's being taught here. I pledge myself, he says, on the penalty of death, should I transgress my covenant vow to you, that I myself will no longer be God if you are ever not my people. That's what he's saying here. It's this divine. That's why Bethlehem, so humbled as the Son of God appear, is divine. That's why the Holy Spirit poured out is a divine thing. That's when he visits you and saves you and your children. That's a divine thing of grace and the blood of Jesus. The covenant grace, the covenant Christ. And finally, beloved, this is for covenant testimony. That's the word I use here. Because we need to testify of these things. And the way we do that is not first by talking, but it's by doing by believing, you should say, and then living out this faith in God. That's a very comforting thing. That's the first thing. If there's a people that's the family of God, and we are, by the grace of God, we're going to laugh together. We're going to cry together. We're going to, we, we're going to go through life together. We're going to give. We're going to take. We're going to receive. We're going to be sensitive to one another, and we're going to learn one another and we're going to be so winsome that others may be gathered into our midst and join the family because they'll know it's not about us being respecter of persons or God. It's about God receiving sinners into the family. It's going to be this happy place, this believing place, this believing in the promised place. So that is the canons of Dort say. Even if, God forbid, you have to lay one of our little ones in the grave, the little children... We have no reason to doubt that they go to heaven. Why? The covenant of grace. God is the God of us and our children. Bring them to be baptized. And as Abraham, who is known of God, walked before God blameless as the covenant 
family people. And children are called as well to respond, to respond to what baptism signifies. Believe. Show forth the fruits of God's own love to you. Be a child of the Father of heaven in being a faithful son, a stalwart son of your parents, honorable, loving, and giving also in the church of Christ. Covenant family, covenant grace, covenant testimony. May God bless us to testify of these wonderful things. In Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of covenant. You make it with us and our children, and you will not be denied. So we pray, Father, to believe. Help our own belief. We live in this flesh, and we are those who are prone to irresponsibility, to unbelief, to pride, to forsaking our vows of baptism. And Lord God in heaven, we pray, may it be found that we are on our knees then, praying, O oh God, for more of your spirit, more of Jesus, more of the word to have its powerful way in us so that we can be a testimony in this world by our living and our speech of the truth of the family salvation of God. Hear our prayers and bless us. Dismiss us with your favor and peace. Amen.